Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Scott Melbourne, and I am the director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts at Southern Oregon University. Please note that I have you all on mute, and please keep your Zoom on mute until we get to the Q&A at the end. You may use the chat section of your Zoom to enter any questions you may have, and I will monitor the chat and perhaps leave the questions for the very end when we open it up for you all. Our special guest today is Tanaz Farsi. Born in Iran, Farsi lives and works in Eugene, Oregon, where she is on the faculty at the University of Oregon and co-chairs the sculpture program. Her work has been exhibited at venues including the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art and Disjecta Art Center, both in Portland, Oregon, the Pitzer College Art Galleries in Claremont, California, the Tacoma Art Museum in Tacoma, Washington, the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Delaware Center for Contemporary Arts in Wilmington, Delaware, and the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She has been granted residencies at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, UCross Foundation, McDowell Colony, Studios at Mass MoCA, Santa Fe Art Institute, and the Rauschenberg Residency. Her work has been supported through grants and awards from the Oregon Arts Commission, the National Endowment for the Arts, University of Oregon, the Ford Family Foundation, where she was named a Haley Ford Fellow in 2014, and the Bonnie Bronson Visual Arts Fellowship in 2019. Tanaz, welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. And just to get started, how are you and your family doing in these pandemic times? <laughs> We are, we are hanging in there. Um, some, some days are really great and other days are a, a little bit harder, but, um, but we definitely feel the privilege of, of being in a state that doesn't, that the um, you know, numbers aren't too high and um, yeah, we're doing great. Excellent. Well, I just made you the host so you can take over and uh, present your presentation um, at your convenience. Um, so thank you so much to uh, Jill, Richard, and of course, Scott for uh, including me in this great program of um, uh, including many artists that I admire um, and have looked up to as well as uh, filmmakers. Um, so thanks, thanks for that, for the invitation to be part of this really um, time, timely exhibition. And also thanks to Jason Hayes for um, for setting up my work remotely <laughs> because of uh, of the uh, of the pandemic, and and also for um, uh, for taking the documentation that you see of some of the pieces that are in, included in the in the in the in my PowerPoint today. So thanks so much for for having me. And thank you all for this uh, taking your lunch time to be with me here today to to talk about some of the pieces that I have in the show. Um, uh, I wanted to start out with I don't know if it, uh, all of you have maybe been to the museum and seen I know that the uh, there, it's under uh, social distancing kind of uh, guidelines, but I'm not sure who has seen it or not. So. I haven't seen it, unfortunately, <laughs> which, which makes me really sad uh, because I created for this exhibition some new pieces um, that haven't been shown before and included some old, older work um, uh, that in the past couple of years I have been working on. Um, a lot of my work uh, is kind of an amalgamation of things lately. Um, a lot of uh, the kind of way I describe it, or the way that I would describe my work would fall under installation practice. Um, and an installation practice is a type of practice that tries to kind of think about space and objects and um, uh, you know, the room that you enter, the kind of emotional experiences you have in the room, all of those kinds of things tied up together uh, to create an experience for the viewer. And so um, when I first started working, I was much more interested in these overall uh, all encompassing spaces that one can be taken away from, you know, taken away from the actual world and step into. And most recently, 
um, I'm kind of interested in installation within a more language-based construct, like the idea that the pieces maybe in some ways kind of form a sentence, you know, and a sentence kind of can connote a paragraph of ideas and that the viewer in some, in some ways becomes um, intertwined with those ideas and it becomes an entryway to um, access information. And so a lot of my work has dealt with uh, ideas of migration and um, displacement and and what it means to you know kind of be present within multiple cultures and um, what that means as a person that is an immigrant in the United States um, and a lot of that kind of has concerned the idea of erasure because in this country there's a lot of um, ideas around uh, becoming a citizen that has to do with forgetting where you come from, you know, whether in, within one generation or multiple generations. So I've been kind of curious about that idea recently, like, what do we erase? How does that erasure happen um, societally and culturally here? Uh, because when you sometimes go into other countries um, and you hear, uh, you, you, you walk into different neighborhoods, there's a different kind of strength of um, I don't know, maybe it, it's something I have noticed uh, recently is that there's a different strength within the different communities in different countries that um, some cultures are maybe more um, able to kind of cluster and grow within a dominant culture than maybe what I have seen kind of happen in the US. So anyway, I wanted to start out with this piece, Points of Departure, that started um, kind of thinking about the work, the names that you see in the gallery. Um, there were three pieces that I put, or there were a couple more than three pieces, but three pieces that I want to talk about that um, came together in this work. And I was trying to kind of think through um, uh, different cultural or um, historical moments that are that were important in um, Iranian culture. And one of them, of course, is uh, the tulip, the flower. And it, it is such a mythological kind of flower in Iranian culture. For this piece, I grew um, a, thousand, a thousand tulips, um, forced them to bloom uh, in the gallery in March 2017 that coincided with the Persian New Year. Um, the, 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 the mythology of the tulip was really interesting to me in that it's both some a flower that's kind of marks a, a certain kind of martyrdom um, and that also marks uh, the idea of hope and renewal. It's kind of a flower that's been associated with the uh, Marxist kind of connotations, politics within Iranian culture. Uh, Iranian politics and as well within like Islamic kinds of um, martyrdom. So from from the blood of the young, tulips will grow was a very popular uh, Islamic poster that, that kind of rep was reprised in the post-79 revolution. So I was kind of interested in reclaiming this idea of a tulip and uh, thinking about it in relationship to uh, the other pieces that are happening. So these are um, made into these kinds of um, grain sacks. There's a plastic that I've made uh, the sacks from, but they're in the shape of a grain sack and the flowers were planted in there and they were let to kind of die over the months um, that they were in the gallery. And these particular tulips are not the tulips that are the most kind of um, cultivated, um, you know, the tulip clay craze and whatnot, uh, they were the most indigenous kind of tulip that I could find to the area. So although these have also been, of course, cultivated, but they're the kind of truest to form of what was, was now once found in the kind of mountain sides of the Iranian plateau. Um, the second piece that I wanted to kind of think about um, had to do with the geometries that you saw on the floor here. And, and um, I was kind of curious about working with the idea of uh, the ornamentation that resides on a lot of, the, uh, on a lot of uh, buildings in Iran, whether they're mosques or public buildings. And I was kind of curious about, um, you know, when we talk about uh, this type of uh, patterning, uh, architectural patterning, so much of it is lost as far as what kind of history it may have or where it belongs to. The whole kind of um, 
uh, Western part of the Asian continent becomes this kind of one lump sum culturally and, um, and politically in some ways at times. And so I was kind of curious as to finding um, these kinds of what people call maybe Islamic patterns or uh, quote unquote oriental patterns and um, like where, you know, something that was actually much more related to, um, to Iran, like to, to a particular development of uh, the culture and mathematics and science of the area. And so I kind of came across this, uh, this scroll called the Tupkapu scroll, which is um, something of uh, um, their architectural drawings that are found. And these are 117 architectural drawings, three example, four examples of what you see in front of you here. Um, and what was really interesting is that uh, it's kind of been dated by the art historian Golru Nisipgalu to uh, 15th century Iran, um, to the Western areas of Iran. So I found that interesting um, that, that there was this kind of place that this, this workbook came from. And I was curious about how I could work with these patterns to kind of um, I don't know, maybe have a collaboration with history in some ways. What I found interesting about her research is that up to that point that um, a, a lot of the, the patterning is just seen as a kind of a decorative a decoration without any, any kind of anything else that is behind it. And what's really, what I find really interesting about her research is that she starts to kind of link ge the, these geometries to different um, eras of um, empire at the time, and also think about it through scientific accomplishment, uh, mathematical accomplishment, astronomical accomplishment. So, so it's kind of like a really interesting coded and dense, uh, becomes a coded and dense text. And I was kind of curious about how to work with it. Another um, aspect of this that I found interesting was that it isn't a, these patterns are not found in any existing buildings. So she dated it by, um, by kind of coming up with the closest examples that she could find of existing buildings. So I love the idea that there aren't anything, there aren't any physical other than the booklet imprints of, of these patterns. And so it became exciting as a way to really kind of collaborate with this, probably like a person that drew these from, it came from an, a workshop. And I think that it's um, said to have been made by one person. So, so it just, there's something kind of interesting in the reprisal of these patterns into physical form that I became excited about. And so the piece that you see on the left, it's about a 24 foot spread on the gallery floor and this is shot from above. And so these kinds of patterns um, also become really exciting to me because they are about um, a sort of, um, uh, a similar kind of way that installation works within an object, that everything falls away and you become centered and decentered within the object. And so as you walk around this piece, um, what's, what's interesting to me is that the position of your body shifts what you perceive. And so that is, to me, so much a part of what maybe an immigrant experience is, is about, um, that idea of the shift and shift, uh, continually shifting perspective. Um, that, that happens within these geometries. The history of these ge geometries are also extremely interesting to me in that um, you can also look at this Vedic table, which is an Indian multiplication table on a sets of nine. So on the left-hand side, we start with the one and on the top left, you, you end with a nine. And by just following um, the, uh, the multiplication, you create the rest of, of the table. And the symmetries and the patterning that starts to ensue um, creates those patterns, those geometries that you saw um, in, in this drawing. So the third part of this, uh, the third part of this installation uh, was a was a series of names. I started to kind of collect a grouping of names of Iranian women that um, were had some kind of a public impact in um, in the culture and and I, and I was kind of curious because when I started to ask my you know I started with kind of asking my mom 
um, who her heroes were when she was growing up. I was just very curious about who she kind of looked up to and what writers, you know, she was interested in. Of course, she gave um, a few of uh, a few very public figures, and then she um, was was obviously listing, you know, like aunts or mother or. Um, cousins, etc. So people that are formed from the interior of the domestic space. And I was kind of curious about this kind of shift between um, women's political, intellectual, uh, creative thought outside of the domestic space, because a lot of times in um, historically and in contemporary time, uh, maybe Iranian women aren't necessarily given the voice or the space to freely um, uh, initiate um, a sustained intellectual output without uh, fear of certain reprisals. So I started to kind of collect these names and the names are of martyrs and of writers and of um, political figures, lawyers, people that have had some kind of um, relationship to creating intellectual thought in public space. And these kinds of pieces just circulate around each other. So I love the idea of posing these different kinds of ways, um, you know, that, that the flowers in turn turn these women um, into mythological kind of uh, ideas as well. You know, that there's this kind of relationship that gets posed between the multiple pieces of work. And this is a kind of latest um, rendition of the, of the um, Tokkapu scroll that I, I have been working with. And instead of creating different layers to create that decentered quality that I was speaking to earlier, um, I, I have been kind of stringing them up. And you'll see this with the Ford Fellows traveling show coming up at the Schneider Museum in a few months, I believe. So, so this is the kind of latest space I've taken those geometries. Um, to get closer to, to some ideas behind the names that I, I started to speak to, um, I, I also, another, another um, piece that I became interested in that also lives at the Tapkapu Sarai Museum um, is this painting uh, that I, that's actually also from the 15th century. I found them at different times, but both are from the 15th century and both live at the same place. Um, and I, I was so fascinated in this, with this painting because it's so similar to uh, modernist abstraction, right? And you're thinking about um, repetition and rhythm. And in this though, uh, the, the, the geometry spells something and it's very abstracted, but it's about this kind of play between a language that doesn't necessarily give you um, information the way we imagine language to give us information. So I, I loved these kind of uh, squarish rhomboid forms. And this rhomboid form is actually a pretty kind of uh, significant um, shape in, in uh, Iranian language. This is drawings for techniques of proportion text. So uh, when, uh, when the Islamic language, Persian Islamic language was becoming standardized, these rhomboid forms um, create a kind of symmetry to the measurement of um, individual letters. And so like if four going up and down is the ah sound uh, and six coming down is the curve of the kh, it, it, it starts to unify handwritten text for the dissemination of books. And so I just love this idea of these um, rhomboids being about proportionality of, of establishing a canon, in, as we see in here, a canon of text. And I've used it in multiple ways um, in, in my work. And uh, I, in the 2017, with the previous exhibition that you saw, this is a polyester vinyl that's on the wall. It was the first kind of attempt at creating this work where I, where I made um, a, a font from those rhomboids in the English language and kind of transliterated the names of the women into, into that. Um, into this font. Okay, um, so with this piece, so there have been a couple of versions of this. 
this particular version, and again in 2017, um, titled The Names. Um, I, 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 I put together the names of all the uh, political women, polit political prisoners that were um, uh, being held in Iranian jails and, and tried to think about um, the window as this kind of space or opening um, as a kind of site specific ways to think about that notion of incarceration. And so the, um, the way that the text is set up is that the women's names are in the center and their crimes are on, on the right and left hand side. And um, if you just give me a moment, I'd like to read a little bit from something I have written about this. Uh, okay, so this, yeah, second version. The, the window a median be between public and private space can be seen as a spatial metaphor for incarceration and the veiling of the body. I've become increasingly fascinated by the lack of reason in the charges that have landed these women in prison, as well as the Iranian incarceration system at large that one can be placed in jail for corruption on earth, one of the many charges along with insulting the sacred and involuntary manslaughter, self-defense against rape, dictates the state as the utmost authority on a subject's interior life, her ability to dream to exist with rights to her physical presence. There is great irony in the direct definition of those words. Is earth the planet, dirt, or terrain? Does corruption indicate evil, contamination, or indecency? So there's just kind of, there's so many, um, it was so bewildering, the idea that these charges um, would be, would, would incarcerate um, the intellectual and creative spirit of these women's and women. And so the reason I wanted to, or maybe I'll reframe that, uh, I was kind of really excited about the window because the window also gave me an opportunity to create um, the text in a type of Iranian writing called Tashie or Hashie Nevisi, which is, is kind of um, uh, margin, translated loosely as margin writing. Here's a close up of the image, and you could see the front and back. You have two different experiences, of course, on the outside of the building with the reflection of everything around it and inside of the building with, with what it allows you to see and not see. Um, so this kind of style of writing is uh, is called yeah tashie or hashien. Let me see if you look on the right hand side and you see the marks in the column on the uh, not in the column in the border on the right hand side. Um, this border writing or margin writing can be translated as a different a variation in understanding the text or a revision of the text. Sometimes. It, it brings in extra information about the text that, that may not be necessary to put in the main columns. So I just love this idea that there's this kind of intertextuality to the information that is added generationally or within mul to multiple people, people, with multiple people's collaboration um, in an individual work that is a public and finalized kind of um, work of its own. And so with that, uh, the the windows became a kind of interesting way to explore that intertextuality of building upon ideas or creating canons as well as um, forming the list. Um, so then I, I was um, invited uh, maybe now two years ago um, or last year to uh, to be part of a show with uh, a few other Iranian artists in San Francisco. And, I, and the curator, Tarana Himami, wanted the, this piece, The Names. And so I really wanted to think about a different way of creating um, the work that didn't have to do with the vinyl that would come down after each um, exhibition uh, was complete. There seems like there was something so uh, temporal about it and I wanted something that actually had more physical presence. So then I uh, created a, another iteration of this work um, and they are kind of bookended on the right hand side but uh, yeah each column uh, is you know suggests the names of the women and I had added so there in this variation there are a hundred names that 
have been put together. And I just love the idea of the kind of continuation of this work that um, maybe I just keep adding to it. Maybe there's like another way to kind of keep the work going. Because obviously, you know, it, it's in some ways like any kind of list that tries to mark a type of canon is already um, implicated in its own shortcoming because it couldn't possibly cover everyone that has created um, any kind of in intellectual output culturally. But I guess I was kind of also interested in my subjective lens of what that could be and what that means and even highlighting the subjectivity of these canons and the idea of inclusion that comes up with this work. And here is a detail of it. And so the first and last names are together and they're connected by the thin lines. And then the, um, the, the kind of more um, prominent rectangular forms are the space between each name. And they're a bit hard to, to kind of read. And there's something interesting I like about that, that they're not, um, you know, I think in my work, a lot of times you have to spend time with it um, in that it doesn't necessarily want to give you easy answers about ideas of representation or knowledge. Um, I'm kind of interested in the kinds of collaboration that can happen that could form other ways of thinking. So um, I guess, yeah, in some ways I'm not interested in telling my viewer what to think, but maybe how we can start to kind of think around ideas together. Um, and I, I also love this way of, uh, how essays are described in that way, because essays are, um, I think, you know, it's Adorno that says our essays are heretical in some way because they don't try to wrap things up very um, smoothly into one um, explanation of something. It, it's a space that allows for a different variety of thought to come and, and conjecture to be formed and um, implicate and um, create diversions from, from the central kind of path of thinking or central argument that happens. So along with that, um, along with the work, I developed a performance of, uh, of, of the names um, in that I was kind of curious about moving away from the names as just a static canon and how to, and, and this is an idea that I'm still working with and I haven't come up with the, um, final solution or final um, form for it yet, but in, in a way that um, kind of creates a performance of the activities of the, of the women. Um, and yeah, and so this is still a work in pro process that happens, that's happening now. Um, since we are kind of getting close to the end, I'm just gonna, I was going to, yeah, I'll just um, go ahead and talk about a couple more pieces that are in the show. So this is another piece that uh, titled American Greetings that you see another variation of it in the exhibition. I, you know, I was just thinking recently as I was thinking about putting together images for, for this um, talk that um, I, I tend to visit the same form over and over again. And for me, it's like, it's like I have found what I want to say, but I don't exact, the form of it isn't quite right. And so sometimes I go back and revise it um, and try to do it in different ways. So this was a stack of uh, cards that my, my family loves to give, give each other cards and um, for birthdays or for whatever other events, like five, six cards at a time per person. And so it, these are all the cards that um, I had gotten from my family and probably many more that I, I don't know where they are, but I'd never actually sent. So birthdays and other kind of uh, events that, uh, that, that I was remiss to kind of mark. And so I, I started to think about just this pile and stack as this unsent kind of um, unsent uh, <laughs> ready-made emotions, you know, because they are have these, um, uh, these kind of writing that is already pre, pre-made for you. Uh, words that are already given to you that are inserted a situation and and it was lying around in my studio and I thought the back of it actually was pretty kind of great it said American greetings and I just that that, that um, phrase just really stuck in into in my head American greetings and it became an anchor for like um, thinking about certain sets of ideas around American kind of politics 
policy, United States policy in the world and um, the effects of that and the effects of that on, on my family as well. And so this is kind of the latest version of that where American greetings is um, pressed into a piece of aluminum um, and the, the words are start on the left hand side and they kind of go down in a column and go up. So I started from something very ready made and and found that almost that was such a gesture. Um, and then I love the idea that 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 kind of thought can transfer to you know, the lineage between the first and the second, um, that the lineage can transfer itself and, and create a different um, feeling of a work altogether. Uh, something that is legible and illegible at once, something that shows uh, bodies within it if you're standing in front of it, uh, because it is about uh, six feet, maybe a little bit over tall. So it really kind of frames the body in specific ways and distorts the position of the body that it reflects back. Uh, next to that piece is a stack of um, stack of sanctions that have been placed uh, on Iran since 1979, the longest, uh, I think it's the longest sanctions that have lo the long longest um, time that a sanction, sanctions have been placed against a single country. And so an ongoing, the this work ended in 2019, but obviously it's still ongoing, starting with President Carter in 1979 uh, after the Iranian Revolution. And so um, for this piece, I had just, I printed these um, individual sheets out uh, on a single page of vellum and then crumpled it up and put it back on. And so there's this kind of activity of, of um, you know, really distorting or shifting or taking out some aggression on the paper that became really important. And I love the name maps with that because that kind of aggression or the shift of my physical um, imprint on the paper starts to create these kinds of map lines. So maybe something um, personal and political starts to collide in the work. Um, the work itself, I think, is also very bureaucratic in some ways, it's like paper, it's hanging in similar ways as um, a, so a file would hang. It has the same kind of um, tabs on the left hand side as, as a filing system. And so the filing system obviously corresponds to presidencies. Um, and I, I found it interesting that, um, that uh, George Bush II is, is the one that doesn't have any uh, sanctions placed against Iran out of all the presidents since 1979 and probably because uh, there was another war happening that was more pressing during his presidency. Um, and across from that, across from these, uh, the American greetings and the sanctions is um, a new work that I am working on. And, uh, or, or I just, you know, I just literally finished it right before the show opened. And I'm, I'm still thinking about this work and thinking about its um, presentation. And I can imagine that it has different lives outside of this fixed form. Um, these are two pages from the back of my grandfather's Quran. And when uh, my, uh, I had my cousin take some pictures of it and send, send to me. And from that, I created these weavings on a jacquard loom, which is a digitalized loom. So I had these images. Uh, I think I was trying to figure out what hour I was born, and my mom couldn't remember. So I, 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 I sent her to look at, at the inscriptions in the Quran, because when... Um, when in our family and a lot of other Muslim families in Iran, when um, a child is born, their name is put in the Quran, and um, they generally have a a a, uh, a name, another name, a, a name that is placed in the Quran as well, outside of the name that is their usual, you know, like their everyday name. And so uh, it's you know it, it's kind of the translation. They're all pretty similar inscriptions and it starts out with uh, you know the that that God gave um, us this gift like the light of our eye and has the name of the person that was born and, and um, 
some of them have the birth hour and some of not mine <laughs> and then the birth date and it's interesting because um i thought this belonged to my grandfather and then when we were looking at it my mom said she found another um Abbas, my grandfather's name was Abbas, another Abbas there, um, that is 1805. So this is, yeah, so the, so the first inscription is 1805. And I think the last inscription is in the 80s. And it's, yeah, it was my grandfather's. And really interesting to think about um, who is, you know, it's, it's like also like an incomplete record because not even all of his own, um, children were named here but me and my sister are my mom isn't but my aunts are and some of other our other relatives so it's um you know i think about like thinking about migration and how uh when people move from one place to the other you don't move like the way you would move across a country right like you um move with a suitcase and so a lot of um maybe what you understand about your own history comes from the objects that are around you and the kind of familiar familiarities you have with sight that disappear and so um yeah so and this this was like a really kind of I, I was trying to figure out what to do with it because um i don't have a lot of uh objects i guess in some ways that link um my family's experience of being here to iran like objects that are actually um, somehow important because they're old and they have been in your family for a long period of time. And so then I was just really ex excited to make this, take this from an image. And obviously this exists in Iran with my, with my family and kind of turn it into another object. And, you know, I thought about doing different variety of different things with it, such as, um, screen printing it or drawing it and it just seemed like weaving it would be such a great way to honor the kind of original intention of it um because these are mostly my grandfather this is my mostly my grandfather's writing and then of someone else too i don't know who that would be maybe his father um as an heirloom and yeah so like the idea of cloth as an heirloom became um so much more um important than paper as an heirloom for some reason even though it has originated as, as paper and yeah so i just love the idea that these face the other side the idea of the sanctions and the american greetings um, and maybe yeah span the past 120 years in some ways this is a, a i didn't have the other an image of the other side of the weaving so because the back there's a what you see is a front and a back and so i wanted to kind of have the clarity of both here so this is what you would be looking at in front of those objects um, we just have a couple more minutes left so uh, maybe we can just talk about a few other pieces that are in there so yeah so like this idea of movement of of like politics being personal and politics being something that's much obviously larger than us is is present and the objects that carry these kind of cultural cultural meanings um that become specific and un un unyield unyieldy un unwieldy in in the same hand um so i've been kind of working with the series of uh of of rugs in different formations. I think another rug will also be in the exhibition coming up at Schneider Museum. Um, that's a flying rug, and this one is a stack of rugs. I think the first time I saw these rugs generally wrapped in some kind of a white kind of plastic when they're being stored um, or they're between places, they are so reminiscent of body bags to me because there is a feeling of the body in the rug in that the hand that wove the uh, the rug itself, the idea of hunching over these um, incredible pieces of artwork, you know, that are woven by hand um, with very fine yarn, uh, be it silk or a thin wool, um, and the kind of complex geometries. And again, these bodies, these rugs become bodies because people sit on them and eat on them. They become a sofre or a table or a cloth that you know, people sit on and, and, and eat on the floor, or they become cushions um, or, you know, pillows on the couch. And then they become wall hangings. And they, so there's this kind of 
the whole realm of the precious to the functional that happens within it and so much labor that is hidden and revealed. And so, um, and you know, like of the commerce that's immersed in them. So I love that they become a uh, stand-in for so many, so, so many locatable kinds of ideas that, that, um, that can be found in what the productions, what can happen in the production of these rugs and how things are given value. This was then a close up of it, of actually of this particular rug. And this uh, was a, I don't know, kind of like rumination on um, the idea of the body as a rug. It was a different variation in thinking about that. That's much more representational than the first image. I think the first image, when you have a, a slumped form, there's, all, all it, there's like immediately an understanding of a body attached to it. And maybe this definitely pulls that forward a bit more. And if you look really closely in the, in the darkness uh, above, below, and to the side of the image, you'll see the hair of a woman that's in this kind of form. Um, that's almost like a missile form or a, uh, a like a pieta form, a kind of a grieving or a mournful uh, form um, and encased, encased in this kind of a shroud and the shroud is the rug here. Um, and I will end uh, with this back to this first image as a last image and um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tanaz. For every, anybody who may have a question, you have a, a couple of options. You can type it into the chat and I could read that aloud to everyone or if you would like to unmute yourself and have a question or a comment. Um, I have a question to Naz in regards to your grandfather's Quran piece, the armature, uh, the stand you created. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why you opted mm -hmm. to create the sculptural form as opposed to, you know, hanging them on the wall or placing them somewhere else? And when you get that sideways view, the armatures kind of create that cloud-like form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I kind of struggled with that because I love the front and the back of those because I think they give you different kinds of moods and information. Um, one is the legibility of the text and the second is this kind of darkness that emerges from the backside of the warp. Um, so I, I love the kind of mood the back created and I guess I was just, I was interested in the, you know, how a book is, um, the book becomes part of the space of a body in the way that it kind of sits on a lap or is carried, carried around in a bag, etc. And so it just made more sense to me that the pieces had that kind of relationship to the body different than a two-dimensional optical image. Um, I love the idea that they, they, they have a kind of uh, they become bodies themselves in a way when they're hung on that armature. And I was kind of curious about that armature too, you know, cause I, 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 I it's much harder to deal with fiber as a material than I thought of like, well, what do you do with this thing after you weave it? And I'm generally, you know, a lot of times, even though I do make photographs, I even I find those to be sculptural cause then they come out of the wall or the way they're situated. And so, um, to me, there wasn't a, I, ever an idea that they would be flat on the wall because my brain kind of doesn't think like that. But I was having a hard time figuring out how do you, like what is the relationship to the stand that it's, it's, it's um, kind of displays it. And I think it does that a little bit, it displays it. And then also those arches, I was kind of interested in hiding the fact that the structure is there. And then when I was thinking about looking at the image, those arches that are found in the actual drawing and then the lines of the writing become the arches that are encompassing the frame. So it's kind of this interpretation of the image became also the, the basis for the frame. With the, the new piece, the photograph of the rugs, you know, we had that 
hung low as per your instructions. And most likely if our wall did not have that floating wall, if it went to the floor, you'd probably also want that touching the mm -hmm. floor. Um, you know, and you, you spoke about the body. It also kind of looks like a family portrait, you know, kind of photo photograph yeah. image. In the, with the body rolled up in the other rug, um, have you thought much about the connotations of a deceased body or a dead body uh, attempting to move one? There's this sort of common theme uh, we see in television and movies where there is a, a body rolled up in, into rugs. Have you thought about that as a connotation as well? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, I mentioned that the first, you know, like one, I'm being struck by the fact the rolled rugs look like a body, like a body in a body bag, because um, they're, they're always wrapped in a kind of plastic. And the way they, you know, that because of the kind of weight that these rugs are actually pretty weighty. Like it is like moving a big body around. And so the, the kind of, yeah, the doubling of the relationship. I like that form because it reminds me of the Pieta form too, like of the dying Jesus in the arms of Mary, which is like an image that I have. I used actually a long, long time ago when I first started making art of a boy with a rock in his hand in that form because it's a form of mourning, you know. Um, so I just, I really like the kind of connotation of mourning and veiling that happens with the body in relationship to it. I don't know if I have any more of a kind of a direct way of, it's just to me, it's like an emotional form. And I like that it, it speaks in a really different way than um, the stacks of, because the stacks of bodies the stacks of rugs talk about bodies, but in a really different way, like the abjection of the body, how the body moves or the physical mass of the body. But because of the, um, the, the way the body is concealed in a rug, I think that that image actually thinks about it, the body in a really different way than its physical matter, its physical stuff. It becomes emotional in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, and, you know, talks about mourning in that way. That's different than the physical demise of the body. We have a question in the chat. Um, Sanaz, do you have an exhibition in Eugene? No. No. Okay. <laughs> not, not at the moment. Not at the moment, no. I'm trying to think. <laughs> what year are we in? What day is it? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I don't think so, though. <laughs> It's 2019, don't we wish? <laughs> I'm going to be so productive next year. <laughs> yeah. um, going back to the names project, uh, what we have on view in the Schneider Museum's galleries, is that the total collection you, of names through your research of women who have made intellectual contributions to Iranian culture, or is that just uh, an edited version of the total number of names you've collected. That is an edited version. And of course the list is kind of always ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that is, that is, I think that that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's like that segment is just, uh, what is it? Three feet by 20. So it's just, it, it, it could endlessly go on, but for the exhibition that I had, um, this, it kind of the exhibition that I made it for dictated the space of kind of how many or how many names I would use at a time. And so that became part of the kind of limitations of what to show. Um, and I guess maybe in some ways, just having the list of names <laughs> is a lot easier way of kind of contending with that uh, idea of being inclusive. But I also kind of, I think that having a limitation on what is shown also maybe talks about how individuals set forth a particular um, lens towards something, you know, and this is kind of my lens towards something. So I think the implication is that it's not complete because it is my lens into that, in, into my subject. Well, for comparing and contrasting, have you seen and been able to compare a list of uh, male names who have made contributions 
intellectual contributions to Iranian culture. I'm curious to know of that that difference uh, in count if it's at all thought about. No, but I, I think any oh sorry um, any kind of like uh, how did I start to you know when I started to kind of think about authors um, and think about poets and think about so obviously. Um, you know, in every culture, uh, we can say, or in most cultures, the intellectual output of women hasn't necessarily been on par, um, tallied on par with with that of men, and that's for different kinds of reasons, right? Um, but I think in Iranian culture, like at at various times, the idea of the the woman being something that's very um, intrinsic to domestic space that the kind of um, value that they brought had to do with domestic work um, or child rearing etc trumped other ways that women could be represented in public space mm -hmm. so I think there was um, a, a tar um, oh my gosh why did I just her name just um, skipped out of my brain uh, her last name is Milani she talks about um, She's a writer and she talks about how in the in Persepolis, the kind of the dynastic center of uh, of Iranian culture, that um, even though at the time that there were Farzan and Milani, even though at the time there were all kinds of records as far as ownership of land um, and bank records by women, that there wasn't a physical presence of women within the statuary. So there's that there's always been a complicated relationship with visual representation. And I think that is also something really interesting as far as intellectual output in a physical outside space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that hasn't been true for men at all, obviously. And so, um, yeah, doesn't quite answer your question, but maybe some ideas around it. Well, if there are no other questions from our audience, you may ask now or, or email us later if you have any questions. Tanaz, thank you so much for your time and participating in our exhibition in the Schneider Museum. Uh, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for attending the Zoom talk. Mm -hmm.